Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out, for braving the snow, the rain, coronavirus, <laughs> all the things out there that could have stopped you. Um, we appreciate you coming out for what we think is going to be a really interesting and informative night. I'm Jake Silverstein. I'm the editor-in-chief of the New York Times Magazine. Thank you. Y'all definitely have to be the most nerdy people in New York. Because it is a Friday night. It's a Friday night. And you're coming here to hear a bunch of historians talk about the Revolutionary War, so I, I applaud you. Applaud you. <laughs> so I'm Nicole Hannah-Jones. I'm a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As some of you may know um, about last... Oh. I appreciate that. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> we are not at the Apollo right now. I'm going to need y'all to calm down. <laughs> I'll let you know later. <laughs> so last August, um, the New York Times, of course, produced a project to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans to the British North American colonies. And we gathered in this very room to launch that project as part of an ongoing initiative um, that aims to really reconsider and reframe history and the legacy of American slavery. The project was based in large part on recent scholarship into the history of slavery, which has dramatically deepened our understanding of this country's origins and our founding. And that's really what we hope the project itself would do to bring some of that scholarship to a wider audience and to show how the past continues to exert such a strong influence on the present. The project, as I'm sure many of you are well aware, has had an enormous impact and sparked a lot of important conversations about national identity and history. It's also led to some very fierce debates. A couple of months ago, we had some historians write a letter to the editor here at the, at the paper objecting to certain aspects of the project, including our interpretation of the role that slavery played in the causes and motivations of the American Revolution. We defended those characterizations, as did some other historians, but a vigorous argument and conversation has ensued in the, in the time since then. So tonight, we really hope to add more depth and clarity uh, to that conversation and to talk more about what our founding really was about. Uh, we've invited five way more eminent scholars, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We've invited five eminent scholars of early American history to discuss the relationship between slavery and the revolution. And these historians are all engaged in active primary research into this era. And in a moment, we're going to turn the stage over to them. Before we do, I want to uh, thank one of those scholars, in particular tonight's moderator, Karen Wolf. Karen is a professor of history at William & Mary and the executive director of the Amohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. The Amohundro Institute is the nation's oldest organization devoted to advancing, publishing, and promoting scholarship related to uh, early American history. And the OI it also publishes a very influential journal, the William and Mary Quarterly. And they did a, a cool thing today, which is they put out a reading list uh, of uh, articles from the last five decades or so from the Quarterly's archives that relate to the topic of tonight's conversation. So if any of you are interested in exploring this topic further after the, the discussion tonight, that would be a good place to start. And in the New York Times Magazine's Twitter feed, you can find a link to that, uh, to that reading list. So that's, a, that's one thing to do this weekend if this is not enough for you tonight. <laughs> oh, that wasn't on your card, so I didn't realize it was my cue. <laughs> <laughs> I so, that. <laughs> we, of course, want you all to have an opportunity to take part in this conversation as well. So there will be a brief Q&A at the end. Please submit your questions by emailing questions at nytimes.com during the program, and we will pick the best, most thoughtful questions. Um, and now, please uh, help me welcome Karen Wolf to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much. Thank <laughs> you. 
So thank you so much to Jake, and thank you so much to Nicole for inviting me to facilitate this important conversation. And welcome. Welcome to you all. We're so glad to have you here with us tonight. Before I introduce our distinguished panel, I wanted to offer some context for what we're trying to achieve here. First, I want us all to acknowledge that history is extraordinarily compelling. The past is a compelling subject. Shakespeare wrote for The Tempest that what's past is prologue. And yes, inarguably, the past is the context for the present. But history is actually more than context, more than prologue. History is predicate. What we understand of our history is the foundation for how we explain the present and the justification, the rationale for how we plan for the future. This sense of history's consequence is what makes history not only compelling, but very, very powerful. Artists and writers, including journalists, shed light on the present by exploring the past. For research historians, however, the work of history is somewhat different. It is at once both process and product. Historians recover the past by immersing themselves in primary sources, by embedding their work within the writing of other historians, and by sharing their work for feedback. Scholarship is peer reviewed before publication, meaning that it is read and commented on by other experts. And this is how historical scholarship develops, through an ongoing professional conversation about what we know and how we know it. This is also the process that creates so-called revisionist history. To borrow an observation from my friend, the great Civil War historian Ed Ayers, we are all in favor of revisionist medicine. Are we not? <laughs> I think so. Medical research advances through new information, new methods, and new perspectives. For example, just in the last decades, we know that cardiac research proceeded with an overwhelmingly male pool of research subjects, even though cardiovascular research remains a leading cause of death for women. Obviously, we need to study women too. For another example, there are important racial disparities in medicine, from pain management to maternal health, and obviously, we need to study why that is. In short, new information, new methods, new perspectives, new work to be done. And just as our understanding of human, his, of human health is being continually revised through research and study, through information, methods, and perspectives, human history is also newly revised through research and study. And I believe that making this process transparent, sharing with you in particular right now, tonight, how historical interpretation develops and changes is as important as the information itself, particularly in this era of disinformation in an era when information integrity is absolutely at a premium, it's important to share how we come to have the information and the knowledge that we have. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about slavery in the American Revolution. Obviously, that's on your program. But we're also sharing an inside look at that process of historical scholarship. We'll be talking about evidence and analysis, how we come to consensus, if and when we do, and in what ways disagreement about the evidence, the analysis, and the conclusions are productive. Since the 19th century, black scholars in particular have been pointing to the essential contradiction of a revolution with liberty at its ambitious center, yet slavery as an institution protected in the course of the revolution and by the government born of it. And they have pointed to the role played by free and enslaved black people in that revolution. But up through the 1980s, Scholars of the American Revolution largely focused on other aspects of the war and the politics of revolution. It's no coincidence that with a much more diverse historical profession, questions of race, slavery, and revolution have now come to the fore. As we look at this developing scholarship on slavery in the American Revolution this evening, we'll be asking, what are the key events and issues that help us to understand this nexus of slavery and revolution? What are the historical sources that inform our analysis? How has our knowledge evolved? Where are continuing points of debate? And there is no mistaking the stakes of asking such questions about the American Revolution. They bear keenly on our understanding of the nation itself. Here is that fundamental question, which is what Nicole raised in her provocative New York Times Magazine essay, of what was America born and what legacies has the nation inherited? 
Historians, I must note, primarily historians who don't do primary research, either in slavery or in the colonial and revolutionary era, have been much more publicly debating the implications of rooting the revolution in a narrative about slavery rather than a narrative about liberty. For tonight, we're hoping to shed more light than heat on this subject, though I'm confident there'll be a little heat too. I've been told not to use the word historiography, but I must tell you I cannot resist. For you New Yorkers who are out here on a Friday night to talk about history, slavery, and the American Revolution, and the wonderful, insightful process of historical discovery, historiography is that secondary scholarship that results from that process of inquiry. So historiography, it's going to be lit. That's my feeling. <laughs> We are going to try hard not to get too mired in too much detail or to treat important issues as abstractions, both tempting tendencies when you get a group of historians who really know their stuff on the stage. But we are going to work hard. We know that this evening is not for us. It's actually for you. We're excited about this opportunity. We're very grateful to the New York Times and to the 1619 Project for recognizing the value of the past and also for recognizing the value of the ways that historical research informs us all. So let me introduce our distinguished panel who will be joining me here in just a moment. <laughs> They'll be coming out any minute now. <laughs> Actually, we're all just going to sit down here and I'm going to read their accomplishments rather briefly. This panel, right here, sir. <clears throat> Gerald Horn is the Moores Professor of History at the University of Houston. He's the author of more than 30 books and 100 scholarly articles. Most recently, The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America. And he holds both a JD and a PhD. Alan Taylor is the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Chair in History at the University of Virginia. His books have won Bancroft, Beveridge, and two Pulitzer Prizes, most recently for The Internal Enemy, Slavery and War in Virginia, 1772 to 1832. And Annette Gordon-Reed is Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School and Professor of History at Harvard University. Among many honors, she was awarded the National Humanities Medal. And her book, The Hemingses of Monticello, An American Family, won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, among a few other prizes. Elijah Gould is professor of history at the University of New Hampshire. And among his books are Among the Powers of the Earth, The American Revolution, and the Making of a New World Empire. He's completing a book on the least studied of the United States founding documents, the Treaty of 1783, that ended the American Revolutionary War. Help me to welcome them. Okay, so everybody's ready to get nerdy, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay, we are going to start with some questions. I'm going to ask a question of each of our panelists to sort of set some context for us. And the first I'm going to ask is to Annette. Um, Annette, you know, John Adams had this reflection near the end of his life about how the revolution really took place in hearts and minds. It wasn't really the war itself. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about, or kind of sketch for us, how the history of the revolution has kind of proceeded over the centuries from that essential insight that the revolution is about liberty possessed in the hearts of people like John Adams. Well, it started out as most history does in the archives with historians looking at what the so-called important figures of the revolution said about what they were doing and trying to figure out how the 13 colonies decided to leave Great Britain and strike out on their own. So if you think of history using an archive, looking at letters, who are the people, the, the so-called great men who write and do things, that was the first focus to try to figure, figure all of this out. So the historiography started thinking about Adams, Jefferson, Washington, the people who actually became leaders of the new country. And pretty much leaving others out of that, history was, for the longest time, great man history. And the history of the American Revolution went that way. And so other people began to think about it in different forms. People who were more interested in Great Britain, looked at imperial history, looked at it as a, the story of the revolution as a, as a stage in 
the British, ongoing British story of history. Mm -hmm. uh, the progressives came along and thought of it in terms of economics. They looked at it and said, why are these people doing these things? It's not about high ideals. Mm -hmm. It was about their economic interests. They wanted to move west, mm -hmm. and they were upset because Great Britain forbade them from going west and making deals with Native Americans and to sort of hold the line. Um, and that school of historiography went out, and then there was a consensus school and went to the point where people began to see that, no, it wasn't about class struggle. Yeah. Uh, it was much, much more, de more mundane than that, and it was sort of a combination of thinking about great men and you know, with some more attention to common people as well. And as you said, it really wasn't until the 20th century, the late 20th century, that people began to say this is a broader story than that. And we were talking before about how every historian is writing in terms of the, the particular preoccupations of the time. And certainly the civil rights movement and changes and attitudes about women brought forth new understandings. And people began to look at the same things, the same material that people were looking at before yeah. and saying, there's another idea here. There's another perspective for us to go to. So it's never standing still, as you said before. It's constantly moving. It's constantly being revised as we ask new questions because our times change and things yeah. interest us more. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I'm, I, later in the conversation, I want to come back to two of those points that you made about archives and what, what material we have to interpret yes. the revolution. And then also that question of how people can see the same archival material from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to go to Alan now and just ask you to talk a little about, about the history of slavery. I mean, Annette has given us a picture of interpreting the American Revolution over time in terms of what we might call historiographical schools, that is, interpretations focus on one particular question and they move to another question. Can we say anything of like that about the history of slavery? Well, we certainly can. I think the, the public tends to have a picture of slavery that's um, most appropriate to the middle of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. we, we think about the eve of the Civil War. We think about cotton plantations. We think about the Deep South as being the real heartland of slavery. And what historians have done in the last 30 or so years for our period, the earlier period, is to recover just what a dynamic system it was. Now, by dynamic, I mean it's a system that's evolving very rapidly. And so the, the slavery that we find in the era of the American Revolution is, is, is significantly different. Uh, there isn't much cotton. And the center of slavery is not the Deep South, which has not been settled yet, yeah. uh, except for a little bit of Georgia. It's, it's Virginia. Half of the enslaved people in the 13 colonies were in one colony, Virginia. Uh, they are not working on cotton plantations. They're growing tobacco. They're growing wheat. They're doing every job in the world. Um, and Virginia is the most powerful state in the new union. It's the home of presidents. It's the wealthiest and it's the largest state. So what goes on in Virginia uh, is uh, going to have an enormous weight throughout the whole country. And the, uh, another big difference is that we're used to the so-called positive good argument that's used in the middle of the 19th century, which allegedly, which alleges that enslaved people are in the best possible circumstance for themselves and that slavery is a benign system for everybody. This is the kind of argument that you can hear from South Carolina or Mississippi's leaders in the 1830s and 40s, but you don't hear it at the time of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you hear instead, particularly in Virginia, is a notion of what they called the internal enemy, that enslaved people were a captive nation. And uh, so this is a notion that on the, on the one hand, you can say at least it's more honest. It, it's about the conflict that's embedded in the slave system. But it doesn't mean that, that these people necessarily are going to give up slavery. Uh, even though they feel imperiled by it. They, they feel fearful that someday there's going to be a massive slave revolt that will destroy the system uh, and perhaps destroy Virginia and other southern colonies. But they insist that they're safer holding people in slavery than having them free and remain their neighbors. So this is the, the famous Thomas Jefferson line about having a wolf by the ears. Yeah that self-preservation says you hold on to the wolf and justice says you let it go. Yeah, thank you. I think um, just two important points I want to clarify that you're, 
you're saying both that it's really important that historians begin to focus on the earlier period. So we know more mm -hmm. about the history of slavery in the 17th and 18th century now. Mm -hmm. And you know, that wasn't the case up until like the 1960s or 1970s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then through the research that you're talking about, we know more about what people like Jefferson and other kind of founders thought about the distinct slavery of their era that was really different from mm -hmm. the 19th century. That seems really important for us to think about, just that slavery is a variable institution. Um, that means people experienced it <coughs> differently. Um, I'm gonna come back to that too. Um, so Gerald, my question for you, my context setting question for you, mm -hmm. um, is about something quite specific, which is a piece of, um, well, it's a piece of evidence, but it's also a moment in time. Uh, which is something really consequential when we think about slavery in the American Revolution and that may not be familiar to our audience, which is Dunmore's proclamation. This is a big moment, right? Um, and I want you to tell us a little bit why that is. I, you, I, I'm gonna take, um, I'm gonna quote you. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you said in your most recent book, In the Counter-Revolution, you said, um, as things turned out, June 1772 was not only on a level with July 1776 as a determinant of the future of British North America, but in a sense was a necessary stepping stone to the latter, better recognized date. Can you talk about that? Well, first of all, let me have a moment of silence for the indigenous population and the enslaved population that helped to build this country and this city. And second of all, with regard to Dunmore's proclamation, even the critics of the 1619 project have suggested that his edict in the 1770s was a tipping factor in terms of enraging Virginia planters and causing them to violate the law by organizing rebellion against British rule. But in order to understand why this edict, which suggested that uh, Britain would free the enslaved population that would come across to the British side and help to discipline, if you like, the planters and other rebellious forces, it might be useful to understand a larger question, uh, which is represented in a book that came out a few years ago by Christopher Brown and Philip Morgan arming, arming slaves. Yeah. Uh, that is to say that historians well recognize that before 1800, a significant, if not disproportionate, percentage of those who crossed the Atlantic were of African descent. Uh, we know, for example, that with regard to one of the most bloody revolts of the enslaved before 1776, speaking of Stono's revolt mm -hmm. in South Carolina, uh, which evidence suggests was engineered by Angolans. So that 1740 is to say. Or, or 1739, right? Oh, Pardon what did me. I say? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm oh, just, just okay. filling in. Oh, I say. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> little detail here. Okay, sir. Anybody's taking notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, that Angolans, uh, who have a long history of warfare uh, stretching into well into the late 20th century, uh, may have been assisted Mm -hmm. by uh, Africans in uniform from Spanish Florida mm -hmm. uh, who were coming in and out of South Carolina. And, and by the way, I think that we can better understand uh, Dunmore's, Dunmore's edict if we understand that Spain, which was contesting England and Britain for power, did not necessarily have the same policy uh, with regard to Africans in uniform, uh, for example. And this, in my estimation, was putting competitive pressure on London, particularly since there are all these defections uh, from the British. Uh, we know, for example, that a, a central figure in North America on behalf of the Spanish was named O'Reilly, yeah. uh, that a founder of the nation that came to be known as Chile was O'Higgins. In other words, Irish were defecting to the Spanish that had been doing so yeah. for decades, if not centuries. Uh, we all know about the Scottish revolts in the middle of the 18th century, the so-called old alliance between Scotland and France. Uh, and so there was all these defections. And so London, for various reasons, was having to rely on Africans. And yeah. the same holds true for Jamaica, yeah. where with regard to revolts that were taking place there, uh, they were relying upon maroon communities. That is to say, uh, Africans who had basically escaped the jurisdiction of London and the hills of Jamaica. 
And then the Yamasee Revolt, 1715, they also had to rely upon Africans to repress this attempt by indigenous populations to overthrow the colonial settlement in South Carolina. So there was good reason for the Virginia planters to be <coughs> upset yeah. uh, with London when Dunmore's edict was enunciated in the 1770s. Okay, I pitched that to you badly. Look, can I just rewind that just for one second here? Sure. And say what I, what I was wanting to pitch to you was you. tell us why Somerset and the Somerset oh, decision Somerset is important for Dunmore's <laughs> proclamation. But you have to tell us like what is, some, what is the Somerset decision and what is Dunmore's proclamation and how are those two things related? Because well, you actually relate them in your book. Yes, I read. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Somerset's case uh, actually comes before Dunmore's edict. Yeah. It's a case out of uh, England in yep. the early 1770s that cast doubt upon the viability, shall we say, of slavery in England uh, going forward. Uh, there was nervousness and apprehension as to whether or not this decision would leapfrog the Atlantic. After all, uh, these 13 colonies, colonies were under uh, London's jurisdiction. And of course, that decision uh, was ultimately followed in Scotland, uh, for example. And, uh, once again, as the planters are surveying the landscape, I think they have good reason to suspect that London, which had been, as I said, they had been relying upon Africans to a certain degree in their other uh, colonies, uh, might be predisposed to having Africans discipline these uh, settlers uh, in Virginia. Um, one more point before I turn over the microphone. <laughs> And, and that is, uh, I think in my book, I mentioned the dog that didn't bark. Uh, that is to say that as a result of the so-called Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763, uh, East Florida had mm -hmm. come under the jurisdiction of London. And so it was a 14th colony, if you like. Of course, there are more than that. But it didn't revolt, and I, I suspect it has something to do with pre previous Spanish policy since mm -hmm. 1565, mm -hmm. uh, which, like Cuba, East Florida had a larger uh, free African population, uh, Africans uh, in uniforms. Mm -hmm. And in fact, about 200 years ago, when uh, Florida becomes part of the United States, where it has been ever since, uh, you had a steady stream of exiting mm -hmm. of Africans from Florida to Cuba. Uh, where their descendants continue to reside. And I should mention one more point about slavery, which of course we're talking about African slavery, but we could just as well talk about the enslavement of indigenous populations, the other slavery as mm -hmm. one of yeah. Professor Taylor's yeah. uh, colleagues once wrote in a book. Uh, that is to say a kind of ethnic cleansing where you take the indigenous population, you sell them into slavery, you get profit, and of course this is enraging, <laughs> needless to say, the indigenous population giving them a cause and reason uh, to rebel as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think part of what you're doing is helping us see the deeper background of both the experience of slavery and the institution of mm -hmm. slavery and its variability across British America, um, as well as some of the history of, of revolts and uh, how important those are for what we come to see as the revolutionary era. Lige, I wanna ask you to go broad as well, <laughs> um, Gerald just started to gesture to this, but to the international context that we have begun to see the American Revolution um, really as part of an international order. Yeah. And part of that is a very basic comparison of the American Revolution with other revolutions. Aha, so um, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things I think Gerald's talking about is uh, the way the American Revolution and after it the French Revolution and then even more so the Haitian Revolution create cracks in the legal edifice of slavery. Uh, and African Americans who are never in doubt about slavery's legitimacy or the horrificness of it seize opportunities. And uh, so we see large numbers during the American Revolution uh, uh, claiming freedom. Uh, about 5,000 end up serving in Continental and Patriot forces, we estimate. Uh, perhaps 20,000 accept the offers uh, uh, made by uh, British officials like uh, Lord Dunmore yeah. uh, of freedom. And uh, this becomes a recurring part of the Age of Revolution. It, it, it culminates uh, in the 1790s uh, during the French Revolution, which uh, follows on the American Revolution, based partly in France, but also in the West Indies, in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, what today we know as Haiti. 
uh, where uh, uh, large numbers of, first off, you have a black majority to begin with in Saint-Domingue, uh, far outnumbering uh, the white planter class, and uh, uh, partly in response to local conditions, but also uh, uh, the, the, the language of universal liberty uh, being articulated in France, uh, 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 enslaved peoples overthrow the order, and eventually in 1804, Haiti declares independence. The interesting thing about this is, so we see, uh, starting with the American Revolution, continuing down to the Haitian Revolution, it happens in the Spanish American Revolutions too, the creation of local jurisdictions where slavery is no longer legal. Some of those are right here in the United States, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Massachusetts, uh, 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 but England is affected by the Somerset decision, and of course Haiti, uh, the most radical example of them all. But they take place in an international context where slavery is still the norm and still legal. And this creates tremendous problems uh, for the problem of claiming liberty in this order for uh, 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 emancipated African Americans. Uh, and uh, one of the clearest examples is right here in New York, when the British leave New York, in the spring and summer of 1783, they bring with them 3,000 African Americans uh, who had uh, found themselves behind British lines. Now about a tenth of them are still enslaved. They aren't all free, but the vast majority are free. Uh, but in order to, because uh, the British Commandant, General Carleton, knows that uh, there may be an expectation of compensation for these former slaves, former masters. Uh, he keeps a record of them. It becomes known as General Carleton's Book of Negroes. Uh, it's a fascinating document. Uh, it contains all sorts of details. I, when I first saw it, my knees got weak. I mean, it's, it's just a wonderful. We're going to talk about archives. Uh, it's, uh, uh, they did. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, that's how I know uh, you're a nerd, right? Yeah, that's how you know I'm a nerd. Thanks, Annette. But, but it's kept because Carlton knows that, uh, that, that Britain may end up having to compensate their former masters. Uh, uh, three of those in freed African Americans are the former bonds people of George Washington. Uh, and Washington does not like the fact uh, that Carlton is carrying these uh, black loyalists off. So it's, it's a paradox. And it's the way in which slavery and freedom bump up against each other. And, and actually, one of the real ironies is that the steps toward ending slavery oftentimes have to specify what happens when a formerly enslaved person crosses over into what is still slave territory, or what happens if a slave enters into these new. So the act of abolishing slavery oftentimes ends up formalizing the law of slavery mm -hmm. uh, in really troubling and difficult ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, irony is never pretty. That's that was part of Dunmar. Yeah. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Somerset actually, yeah. because yeah. Lord Mansfield says that you know slavery is so odious yeah. that it can't exist in the English common law mm -hmm. by itself. It has to be as a result of positive law, and there is no positive law in England. Not in England. But, so therefore, they cannot hold him. Right. Virginia is different because Virginia has law. Yeah. They have a code, so that's the code. So that's why they weren't really worried about that because they knew they actually, Somerset doesn't apply to them because they had actually taken the trouble, the Burgesses of actually passing positive law. Legislation, right. Legislation. Okay, so we've set some complicated context here. I'm gonna, I wanna propose to you all um, that there might be three general subjects that we can talk about in terms of the <laughs> evidential- Three. Three. <laughs> three. <laughs> Well, you see the size of the three, you'll see. Anyway, uh, three basic, and you can debate that. You can say no, four, five, whatever. Um, anyway, but uh, three subjects. Let's us get to the kind of evidential connection between slavery and the revolution. Um, actually, all of these discussed by each of you, in fact, and by generations of scholars. So I'm wondering if you would agree on this. Um, one is the kind of the question about um, the hypocrisy of patriot leaders and the question of their use of the language of liberty in the context of slavery and who and which that applies to and how that applies for differently, or does it, for patriot leaders in Virginia, like Jefferson versus like Adams, let's say. So one would be the kind of this question about the hypocrisy. Um, you know, how do you have a revolution for liberty in the context of slavery? The second would be the kind of the role of black, when, black men and women in fighting for their own liberty um, during the revolution. And that brings in some of these questions that you raised, Lige, and that Gerald raised um, about people running 
for freedom or taking freedom when it is offered mm -hmm. by either the British in the course of strategy or whatever. And the third is the kind of the impact of specific British events, the Somerset decision um, and Dunmore um, and the, um, the liberation of New York and Charleston after British occupation. Those are my, those are my general three like mm. kind of capsules that would let us talk about slavery and the revolution. You think those are right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No way. Really? <laughs> Is this a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is amazing. They had, a, they had a really good dinner beforehand. You know, so it's, um, okay, so cool. All right, so we agree on that. All right, good, I'll take that. Um, okay, so could we start with this question about hypocrisy? I mean, Edmund Morgan wrote in his very famous 1975 book, um, uh, why am I, why am American I, why? slavery, American, American slavery, slavery. Yeah, American like, freedom. Right, it's right there, American <laughs> slavery, American freedom. Right, exactly. He called slavery the paradox of American history, the dean of uh, American historians at Yale, he called it the paradox of American um, liberty. So what do, we, what do you think about the, patri the patriots' hypocrisy? How do we begin to even understand their hypocrisy? What are the ways that historians have, for, to your mind, most compellingly dealt with the fact that these are people who, even if they are not holding enslaved people themselves, they certainly witness mm -hmm. and they certainly pass along on a government that authorizes the law, positive law, as Annette said, of slavery. What, what's the most, how, how do we handle that? How do we handle that as historians? I mean, I, there are moral questions here too, but I'm asking about how historians handle that question. Well, can I make a prefatory note? Uh, <laughs> Elijah mentioned the uh, Book of Negroes, yeah. and I assume that there are teachers in the audience, and it would be a useful exercise, I think, to screen the film, The Book of Negroes. Yeah. Yes. Funded by yeah. Canada, South yeah. Africa, mm -hmm. and BET, yeah. Yeah, which presents an altogether film. different perspective on the revolt against British rule than you might see in The Patriot with Mel Gibson. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's different. It's different. It's different. It's different. That is yes. correct. That's correct. So it would be, I think it would be useful. And then to complement that by adding Bell. Uh, starring yes. uh, Google yeah. and Bothell Roy, yes. mm -hmm. uh, which deals with Somerset's case. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's a very compelling uh, piece of cinema. Now, with regard to the first point that you raise, I mean, uh, you know, I just did a book on Southern Africa, and when apartheid was enunciated in 1948, the architects of apartheid made it clear that this was an affirmative action program for poor Afrikaners. They did not contemplate <laughs> giving benefits and rights and liberties mm. to the African majority. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, uh, in some ways, the blueprint for apartheid was drafted in New York City by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, whose records are located here. And so uh, with regard to hypocrisy, I'm not sure if that's the, the appropriate word because I don't think that the so-called founders and fr framers of the Constitution actually saw uh, people of African descent as part of the human family. Okay. Just like the architects of apartheid did not necessarily see the majority in South Africa as part of the human family. And so it would be as if they were being asked to give rights to cattle and horses and donkeys, hmm. for example. Hmm. So I'm not sure if, uh, if, uh, if hypocrisy is the appropriate word. I'm, I think it, it might take us down a path hmm. that might not be that fruitful, whereas looking at how they saw the world, I think, would be more illuminating. Hmm. What do you guys think? Hypocrisy? Lige. Uh, <laughs> well, in hypocrisy, uh, I think of the Lawrence uh, of father and son. I, I don't know if anyone here has seen Hamilton. Uh, but, you know, John Lawrence, uh, the great, you know, enemy of slavery. I could without Hamilton. <laughs> Place right. to be. Yeah. So, uh, but John Lawrence's father, Henry, is probably the biggest slave trader in America. Um, he is, uh, but he also is conflicted. He knows it's yeah. wrong. Uh, it's, and you know that from his correspondence, right? We know that from With his John. correspondence. Right. But it's Henry Lawrence who inserts a clause into the treaty, peace treaty with Britain in 1783, where Britain agrees to uh, not to carry away um, Negroes and other American property. That's a direct quote. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet John Lawrence, at the same time, is advocating for the abolition of slavery. Yeah. And uh, so uh, this is a family, their wealth is totally tied up in human property. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're also, you know, even Henry Lawrence, uh, for all of his involvement in it, 
acknowledges that it's wrong. So uh, I actually, I'm, I have to write about this guy in this book, and I can't quite decide what to say about him. He's definitely, he's a hypocrite. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me. Yeah. I mean, because well, uh, I think he knows conflicted what conflicted views, wrong. right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. He, he says he's conflicted. I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? I'm going to go first. Tag your it. You know, from our perspective, sitting where we do, how we define freedom, mm -hmm. they look like hypocrites. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, if we go back to the very different way that they defined freedom, uh, it, they always see it in conflictual terms. They, always, they, they don't think of it as un properly universal, and this goes to, to Gerald's point, that they see enslaved people as, in, in a fundamental sense, their enemies. And they also, their notion of freedom is wrapped up with property. Yeah. And they see the revolution as a defense of freedom, of freedom to own property and to only be taxed by your representatives and not to have an external legislature take away your property in any way. So when you do that, people who are slaveholders are saying, this is our property. Yeah. And they did not see that as the conflict that we fortunately have come to see that it is. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose we, we see them as hypocritical because, as Elijah is saying, in their letters, yeah. they're talking about this right. as something that's wrong. So it isn't, they have a, a, some of them have an inkling. They're not like the 19th century. It's not like Calhoun. Yeah. And they're saying, okay, the African race was made to be enslaved to the white man. Right. I mean, just full stop. No question. There's no, and it, it's an interesting question. What is it about, you know, why? How does this shift? Well, we know why it comes. The slave prices begin to go up, yeah. and it becomes much more valuable. Mm -hmm. Enslaved people become much more valuable, mm -hmm. and then you change the rhetoric and begin to talk about this is something, it's not a, you know, it's not a necessary evil. This is a positive good yeah. that yeah. slavery exists. So, but it, it, it's an interesting question, because I don't understand, the same reason why people who, you wonder why people who are manifestly racist insist that they're not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they do. I mean, it's true. It's like, you, you know, I read this, this quote one time, a guy who was uh, talking about a, a black man in England who was so, supposed to be running for the conservative party. And this guy said, you know, I'm no racist, but, and then you always know it's that. <laughs> I'm no racist, but it'll be over my dead body before an N represents this district. So we're sort of thinking, what? <laughs> what does it mean? What would be a racist? What, what, what would be a racist? What does it mean? So what I'm getting at is that, that I wonder why yeah. this generation, the one we're talking about, the revolutionary generation, so many of them express those kinds of doubts in their letters, and their grandchildren are like full on. You know, it's like, boom, right off the bat, this is, you know, this is right in what we're going to be doing. So it is a, it's an interesting thing to see, to see some of these people walk, walking that tightrope and just sort of saying, this is where you're living. This is what you're doing. Face what you're doing and be, you know, say it out loud. But, it's, but so many of them don't do that. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting because um, what you're saying here partly echoes what you said before, which is that the history of slavery um, or that understanding the history of slavery is understanding the difference between the revolutionary era and the 19th century, the kind yeah. of caricatured version of American slavery and of um, kind of defenses of slavery that are 19th century ones. And those uh, articulations about slavery in the revolutionary era really do look and sound yeah, I, different. I went through, I was going through a diary of one of Jefferson's grandsons and he's at some point going through the Bible trying to find every quote that justifies slavery. That is so not a Jefferson thing right. to do. But the grandson, that this is, yeah. that this is why it's okay. And, mm -hmm. and you know, chapter and verse, literally, yeah. trying to pull this stuff together. Okay, well, could we, could we press on this just a little bit harder, though? Because um, even if that's the case, it is still that when historians talk about slavery in the revolution, we often look to the language of liberty that they expressed. And even though Alan has said, well, when they're talking about liberty and freedom, they're talking about a different thing. And Edmund Morgan back in 1975 talked about this paradox and said, well, that they really mean is for me to be free, those other people have to be enslaved. Right. Um, but I think there, you know, there is a historic, historiographical, I'm saying it again, there is a historiographical tradition of writing about 
the language of liberty and the language of slavery that they, that the patriots in particular invoke. Mm -hmm. Is there anything more we can say about that? Well, because they thought that they had obtained liberty from Great Britain. Yeah. They'd started a new country. Yeah. And from their perspective, they're thinking, I mean, again, we're talking about the class of people, the group yeah. of people who are the leaders, Patriot the folks leaders, that the historians right. would be, whose papers they would be using. Yeah. They were talking about their business, yeah. what they were doing. And that's why liberty to them was casting off Great Britain and starting on, on their own. Now, you know, 13 colonies, some had more slaves than others, but their big story was we, mm -hmm. we created a new country. Mm -hmm. And as Elijah's written about, uh, we've created a new country and we want to become a part of the Republic of Letters and the Enlightenment world, the West, all of that kind of, that's their focus. They're not thinking about the other people in their community. Yeah, well, yeah let's hear I, I think just to return to these figures that Elijah cited, I think is some of the most important facts we can focus upon when trying to unravel what we're discussing. That is to say, you said that there were about 20,000 who sided with Approximately. red coats yeah. and about 5,000 mm -hmm. with the so-called yeah. patriots. I mean, obviously, the, the folks voted with their feet in, in terms of uh, who they thought would give them the best deal. And I don't think that that's something we should easily uh, mm -hmm. slide by. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the question of class. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say that settler colonialism, uh, that uh, people from Europe coming across the Atlantic of heterogeneous backgrounds, oftentimes funded by investors. So it's a multi-class coalition, not unlike the multi-class coalition that prevailed in November 2016. <laughs> However, I think that oftentimes in talking about slavery, and I, I will say this in particular with regard to some of the critics of the 1619 Project, that they neglect the class question. That is to say, slavery is one of the most profound class relationships that one can think of. Now, we would not expect the enslaved population in 1861 to side with the Confederates, to side with their slave owners. Uh, we would not expect the enslaved population in Texas when it secedes from Mexico in 1836 mm to side with their slave owners. Mm -hmm. And why should we expect <laughs> the enslaved population in 1776 to side with their slave owners, particularly when numbers are pointing in an opposing direction, and particularly given the reasonable inferences we can draw from what happened subsequent to 1776? Uh, that is to say, an exponential expansion of the African slave trade with the US slave traders becoming dominant not only in Cuba but in the biggest market of all that was Brazil, uh, for example. So I think that looking at uh, the enslaved population as an exploited class helps us to understand why they did and did not take political positions. Mm -hmm. Well, should we shift then to just talking about that question about what happens during the war itself and what we know about people who liberated themselves um, or people who took up Dunmore's offer. And if we could, talk, if somebody could actually just specify Dunmore here for just a minute, Lige, you've yeah, got your so hand up. So I, okay, let's talk about, talk about Dunmore first. Well, the interesting thing about Dunmore is- But you gotta, you gotta define it though. Yeah, pardon me? You gotta define it. Gotta define oh, Dunmore's okay. proclamation. Uh, Lord Dunmore, uh, yeah. he's a Scottish yeah. aristocrat. He is yeah. Virginia's last uh, uh, royal governor yeah. uh, of the state the two of our panelists are now from. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, uh, as the revolutionary crisis unfolds, uh, he doesn't have a lot of soldiers on the ground uh, in his garrison. So he uh, decides, he issues an offer to enslaved African Americans and white indentured servants, offering them freedom if they are, belong to patriot masters. Uh, so that he's not liberating the slaves of loyalists or Britons like himself. Dunmore actually owns he's slaves. A slave here uh, so he's actually, his proclamation yep. actually pr protects his own property. Yep. So, uh, you know, I mean, I agree with Gerald absolutely. You know, we've got, you know, more, more African Americans are seeing freedom. Yes, I just want British. you to pause for one second okay. and just say a little bit more about Dunmore, which is the important consequence of Dunmore's proclamation is that people take him up on it. Oh, they do. Yeah, right. Yeah. So can you just yeah, can you just thousands. roll that out just a little so, bit? Yeah, we, and, we and estimate, it, uh, actually, Gerald, you probably know, there's like 1,500 uh, 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 African Americans, actually significant number of white indentured servants early on also yeah. 
flocked to uh, his banner. He raises two regiments, one uh, Dunmore is Ethiopians as a black regiment. The other is like the Queen's Loyal Rangers or something. That's the white regiment. And, uh, but they are, uh, the Dunmore is a, a better politician than he is a military figure. And uh, they're defeated. The other thing that happens to Dunmore's soldiers is that they die disproportionately of smallpox. Right. Uh, and uh, Virginia slaveholders did not tend to vaccinate their bonds people, though an exception to that was George Washington. Who and, did lose some people to Dunmore. Yes. Uh, he did. They, they, they went over to Dunmore and, and a number of them left New York in 1783. Yeah. They didn't die of smallpox. So, um, uh, so anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Th okay, thank you very much. I like that. <laughs> very, very helpful. Um, but so which, could, we, could you just then draw out what you were going to say in response to Gerald about, um, about why Dunmore's proclamation is important when we think about slavery and the revolution. Why is it that it's important for us to understand what enslaved people are doing for themselves right. and how they are assessing the various opportunities they might have from the British or from the patriots? Well, Dunmore's proclamation is widely broadcast. It terrifies whites. Uh, Jefferson references it in the Declaration of Independence and it emboldens blacks. Uh, and uh, African Americans know about it. And it, it certainly is one of the reasons uh, that we see so many African Americans flocking to uh, the British, particularly in the final years of the war in uh, South Carolina and uh, Georgia and North Carolina. Well, what do you all think about Gerald's contention, though, that, the, um, that no enslaved person would see opportunity for themselves with the patriots, with well, their Well, I didn't say that precisely, but oh, well, for the sake of discussion, we can <laughs> Thank you. It. I appreciate wow. that. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, historians argue all the time. We're being incredibly, you know, kind of low-key here, but yeah. Well, it's situational. Uh, so, so most of the people who are African-Americans who serve on the uh, patriot side of it, they're from the north. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in the, in the northern states, you could gain freedom by going into the Continental Army. Yeah. Uh, the southern states, with the exception, partial exception of Virginia, did not allow slaves to gain their freedom by fighting for the Patriot cause. So if they want to become free, their liberator is going to be Lord Dunmore and other British commanders. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of African Americans were held in slavery in the south. Okay, so could we draw this together a little bit and um, ask whether for enslaved people, I mean, at the time of the revolution, there are about 600,000 people enslaved in British America. Um, well, actually it's 600,000 total, right? 90% enslaved, um, anyway, demographics. Um, but that's a lot of people. Is, can we say that people did not find the language of the revolution, the language of liberty itself, compelling and appealing. We well, know that in the period after the revolution in particular, people oh, embraced did, that and used did. that language. They, okay. I mean, African-American people embraced that idea, the notion of liberty, the, the contagion of liberty, mm -hmm. uh, the declaration. People filed freedom suits yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the basis of the declaration. I mean, whether it was meant for them or not, I mean, those are words that people took to heart. So they definitely did uh, see that. So there's, there may be, there's, there's liberatory potential in the revolution of different kinds. Well, of course, potential means you haven't done it yet. <laughs> but in, in any case, I, I think it's important to broaden the scope. Um, we know that in this hemisphere, when there was a confluence between anti-colonial struggles and anti-slavery struggles. For example, in Mexico, mm -hmm. for example. For example, in Cuba, where Antonio Maceo is both a, a national hero, leader of the anti-colonial struggle, and a leader of the anti-slavery struggle. Mm -hmm. Whereas here in the country that eventuated in the United States of America, uh, you had an expansion of slavery and the slave trade as a result of the revolt against British rule. And in any case, we have a kind of control group uh, on the northern border, uh, which is Canada, which was of course under London's jurisdiction, where for decades, as we know, uh, Negroes were escaping to. And in any case, uh, one would expect that the so-called revolutionary country, that is to say the United States, would have the kinds of social welfare measures that the United States looks to Canada for. Mm -hmm. Or even with regard to the French Revolution, which we know helped to instigate the Haitian Revolution, the, um, the most liberatory uh, project uh, of the hemisphere, which created a general crisis for the entire slave system that could only be resolved with its collapse. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think that there are a number of questions about North America that will keep scholars busy for years to come. <laughs> yes, yeah. that, is, that is definitely That's the fun of it. <laughs> Absolutely, right, under, under, understatement here. Okay, so let's go right at something tough here about the 1619 Project. Um, in the 1619 Project, one of the things that Nicole said in this very powerful opening essay is that she said that slavery and the defense of slavery is one of the primary motivations for uh, the patriots. Do you think that slavery and the defense of slavery against a perceived British um, you know, threat to slavery is a primary motive or the primary motive? How can we, how can we even, how can we parse that? Well, I, I think one of the difficulties is that there are so many people, and it's the tradition to say the American Revolution was one thing. Mm. Uh, that there was a, a unified leadership class that spoke for almost all Americans. Mm -hmm. And when you look closely at the revolution, that's not what it was at all. People are bitterly divided, even in the leadership class. And so to conduct the revolution was to build a coalition. And it's a coalition where not everyone agrees with every aspect of the revolution. And so if you're going to build that coalition and you want Virginia and you want South Carolina to be part of it, then there have to be assurances, as was provided to them in the U.S. Constitution. There have to be assurances that their property will be secured. They won't come along. Right. Yeah. And in any case, uh, <laughs> those who wound up in the driver's seat, as we know, before 1861, were disproportionately Virginians and disproportionately slave owners. Mm -hmm. And so obviously either these Virginians were very adroit negotiators or... Which they were. <laughs> <laughs> or, or these other forces in the coalition, such as the lawyer for slave owners, John Adams, mm -hmm. did not have as much leverage as perhaps subsequent scholars have suggested. Well, I think they, and they also had this really crazy idea that slavery was a retrogressive institution, mm -hmm. and that it would be a dying institution. Yeah. And that shaped the way they saw it, the Northerners at least, the Southerners may not. I mean, the Southerners made noises about that, but people in the North didn't fight for, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't, they were sort of playing. Yeah, they you know, figured this, they were playing this will checkers play out and they the were end. playing checkers, you yeah. know, playing chess in the, in the South because it was something, a vital part of their life. They played hardball with it. And the North thought this is something that we will, will solve itself. And they gave up a lot of territory in a lot of different ways. So, um, yeah, they were adroit negotiators. Well, there's, there's also a, a there's distinction also, between the, the Virginians and the, and, the, and the Deep South. Uh -huh. right. The Virginians are open to the possibility that slavery may wither away. Yeah, yeah, but no, not the, not but South not Carolina. Not the South Carolina. South, South Carolina yeah. is always in. And issue. they're the ones that play real hardball. Yeah, yeah, play real hard. But this is different. We're sort of moving, we're, there's sort of a slippage here. Yeah. We're talking about the Constitution and yes, the Revolution. Yes, the Revolution. And right. by the time we get to the, the, the Constitution and they're actually trying to decide where they're going to come together, those assurances have to be made. The American Revolution, what you were saying before, is that everybody has different, the different ideas about that. They're, they're not making, uh, what deal are they making amongst themselves well, at well, that point about Well, James about Warren in 1771 says Massachusetts is considering um, doing something to emancipate enslaved people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he says they don't do it because of, they will offend mm -hmm. the Southerners at that time. Yeah, but So I think this is happening all along. It's mm -hmm. not just the Constitution. It's not just the Constitution. Right. No. I think one thing that's challenging is that sometimes when we think about um, the kind of early American history and we think about the early history of the United States, it's fairly um, common, I think, to sort of wrap the revolution and the Constitution all together. Mm. But in truth, we're talking about decades and decades. decades. Times and when we time. think about you know decades ago, we think, well, that was decades ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, so by the time of the Constitution, the revolution is some time past. Um, and, so, and there's a lot of complex stuff that happens in between. I, I don't right? think that's true. I think, I think the Constitution is part of the revolution. It's part of the revolution, but it's not, 
you think the same? The contexts are different. The though, contexts are different, aren't they? Yeah. Well, the context of 1782 is different than the context yes. of 70. The, I, you know, I think the problem is we have narrowly defined the revolution as the war. Oh yes. Well, that is true. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is true. And the revolution is, is a true. very a long, long complex movement that right. begins in the 1760s and and goes on. I would say until. 1812. 1812. <laughs> okay, so I thought you were going to say 1812. All right. For the sake of discussion, yeah. I was talking about you know the war. Right. Yeah. The war period. But the, the but revolution is more than the war. But you know some of, some of the most important patriot uh, 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 blows against slavery happened before the Constitution under the Articles of Confederation, when the states are much more autonomous uh, from each other. And I mean, Alan's right. There is concern in the North about, uh, uh, about South Carolina in particular, uh, but they do go ahead. And it's actually very interesting if you look at South Carolina right at the end of the war, uh, as the British are leaving Charleston and they're taking large numbers of African Americans with them, the liberators, uh, potential liberators, South Carolinians are worried about her in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, John Lawrence is a particular concern. They're actually trying to get refugees who had fled to Philadelphia uh, located to places that are, that are less anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you, know, you start to see this division you know, between states and between regions over this question. And until the Constitution, I think you can ask whether there really is a uniform American position on, on slavery, because the states are sovereign polities. They, uh, they, they're operating uh, quite loosely, and, they, and, and whether to be slave or not, and what kinds of abolition, it varies widely. Well, could we go back to my reductive um, definition of the revolution for a minute here? <laughs> And the reason I want to push this is because um, I just want to draw out the distinction that we might see between, um, you know, and maybe you'll reject this too, um, but the distinction we might see between um, New Englanders who articulate their desire for revolution in one way and what we know from the scholarship of people like Mike McDonnell, Woody Holton, and others, that Virginians are saying about revolution and slavery, that there really is a difference in terms of the kind of motivation and commitment to slavery from the Virginians that there isn't necessarily so, so from the New Englanders. So are the that, Virginians saying specifically that we're doing this well, I to to um, to pr protect slavery, I think that's what Woody's arguing. Yeah. I don't think, but I've, I've talked to it. I don't think that's his no. argument. <laughs> but that's okay. Is but he that's here? Okay. That's no, okay. but online we have a chapter <laughs> yeah. right now so, on your phones. You can go download it. So, so, yeah. so you know, what, yeah, we've been talking about the American historiography of the, of the Revolution. The British have a lot to say about this too. Yeah. And one of the most interesting observer is uh, Samuel Johnson, the, uh, the author yeah. of the first dictionary. You've probably heard of Johnson. He writes a pamphlet uh, entitled Taxation No Tyranny. The title says it all. And in there he asks why it is we hear the loudest yelps for liberty from the drivers of Negroes. Yeah. And he's asking that, and that's actually meant to be embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I, I think he's, he's writing in a context where he knows that this is something Virginians would rather not admit mm -hmm. uh, that, 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 that these two are related to each other. Mm -hmm. though, though Johnson is arguing that they are. And, and some of the earliest people to make this point are actually British writers about the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. In my preparatory remarks, I should have given a shout out to what happened in Boston yesterday, the 250th yeah. anniversary of the Boston Massacre, where you had protests by people of African descent, people of indigenous descent, who apparently are not necessarily satisfied or gratified with the fruits of that revolt mm -hmm. that the Boston Massacre helped to instigate. I think that in a sense, we responded to Hannah Jones's point mm -hmm. that opened up this particular aspect mm -hmm. because, and I will recommend this to the audience, uh, the current issue of the American Historical Review has an essay about the 1619 Project where it goes over the different mm -hmm. arguments and uh, it quotes one of the sterner critics uh, of the project as suggesting that uh, the Dunmore Edict, for example, at least was a tipping point in helping to push of Virginians, particularly Virginia slave owners, to the point of breaking the law, that is to, to say revolt. Uh, 
And uh, well, I'll stop there. No. You want to respond to that? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually, Dunmore's revolt is hugely important. Uh, but but it, it, you know so but but it, it's par, it's one of a it's sort of a concatenation to use a sixty four dollar word here mm -hmm. uh, you know it's a string of events uh, but but there's no question it's part of the story and I mean Jefferson wouldn't have referenced it in the Declaration if he wasn't thinking of it as part of it but is it the sole cause? Mm -hmm. Well, it also we should mention Thomas Jeremiah. Yes, and mm -hmm. and um, who uh, because a, a rumor comes to Charleston in May of 1775 that the British are going to come and arm enslaved people and help them become free, and this leads Henry Lawrence and others uh, to do a witch hunt, mm -hmm. and they settle on Thomas Jeremiah, who is a free black man of some prosperity, uh, who they feel is too flamboyant in showing his freedom and his mm -hmm. prosperity. And uh, they uh, bring him down in the most brutal way by executing him. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can write about the coming of the revolution and particularly why South Carolina, which had been pretty reticent, mm -hmm. swings over strongly into the Patriot camp mm -hmm. unless you address not just Dunmore in Virginia, but yeah. the story of Thomas Jeremiah mm -hmm. in Charlestown. And which is an important point because I think what we talk about, we collapse slavery and into race into slavery yes. without thinking about white supremacy as a part of the story mm -hmm. that is driving a lot of this behavior mm -hmm. that's not about, I mean, slavery, I mean, he's not, he's not enslaved, he, right? He, he's actu there. he actually owns a few enslaved he, he owns, people. He owns, he owns slaves himself. That, right. So here's a person who is sort of in terms of economically or mm -hmm. social, he's sort of with the uh, with the planter class, well, but middle he's black, class, middle, yeah. you know, but he's black, yeah. mm -hmm. and so I think race is at the heart of a lot of this, yeah. much more so than people responding to individuals as slaves, slaves as such, because even once the that the status is removed, they're still pariahs. Mm -hmm. Just and, and, and in terms of South Carolina, we all know that South Carolina, in some ways, uh, is started in the 1670s as an extension of Barbados. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is to say, people fleeing Barbados, not least because the Africans outnumber the settlers mm -hmm. by several orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. uh, they're periodically on the march, or on the warpath, and so the same holds true. It seems to me that if you if you if you look at these settlers and and, and, and the colonies, particularly in the South, on one side you have the slave revolts in Antigua in the 1730s. You have Tacky's Revolt right. mm -hmm. in Jamaica, 1760, which is covered uh, quite well in the Pennsylvania Gazette, for example. And then, of course, on the other side, there's the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804. So. This is the environment in which they're dealing, uh, which is this fear, if not loathing, of their property, uh, which is troublesome property, and uh, is obviously willing to revolt. Mm -hmm. So uh, the important role of race here. So we've talked about New England, or I've suggested that New England might be contrasted with, um, and I said Virginia, but you could say the South, in terms of uh, the response to revolution and the role of slavery. But what about then race in New England? Isn't race important in colonial New England as well? So if we have a trajectory of revolution in New England that's about taxes and so on, but isn't race critically important in New England as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's slavery in New England at the start of the revolution. Um, and so it, it, we have to be very careful from the old stereotype that northern whites are somehow not racist and southern whites are. It's ridiculous. It's, uh, racism's universal in the United States at the start. And, and well, the other, oh, oh. I mean, uh, and New England is so heavily involved in the economy. Uh, so in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which was my hometown, when I first moved to New Hampshire, uh, in 1775, uh, they ship about 
200 prefabricated houses uh, out to the West Indies. They're slave quarters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're, they're milling barrel staves for the molasses. Uh, I mean, uh, New England is very heavily involved in that uh, a slaving economy. Most so. of the slave traders were Rhode Islanders. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Right. There's a very good documentary film, too, on um, the Newport slave yeah, yeah. traders. I can't uh, <clears throat> recall the title, but you, you ought to be able to, to find it and access it. In other words, in some ways, the slave trade was financed from New England, and then the Africans would be deposited in, say, Charleston or South Carolina, for example. So obviously, it gives the colonies writ large a, a stake mm -hmm. in human enslavement. So part of what you're suggesting then is that this wide transatlantic economy, which is so deeply embedded in slavery and the slave trade, means that there is an implicit, um, well, a complicity essentially in slavery in New England. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. okay, totally. great. So if we have a narrative of the revolution, which is for New England, it's about taxes and the usual narrative about the revolution in New England is about the succession of taxes that make the New Englanders really agitated. And that might be argued to be the New Englanders um, primary cause of revolutionary sentiment, maybe, but we could see that them, we could see them embedded in this implicit, complicit economy of slavery. Does that make sense? Well, everybody's yeah. upset about Parliament's assertion of sovereignty through taxation, everybody. It's not just New Englanders. Right. Um, and lots of things could be going on at the same time. Right, yeah. Right, I mean, a lot of moving parts in all of it. Yeah, and, and, and they overlap. So, uh, and, and one of the concerns, and it starts with Somerset, is that if Parliament starts to take an interest in the slave system, the same powers the Parliament is claiming uh, in attempting to tax the colonies without their consent, uh, it can also use uh, to start making changes to slave law. And there actually are proposals being mooted very much on the fringes and the periphery, but uh, uh, David Hartley at one point, uh, who's a, a sort of a British radical friend of America, uh, uh, proposes to Benjamin Franklin a way out of the parliamentary crisis, uh, which is the parliament will uh, uh, enact a law mandating humane treatment of slaves, and by registering that, the colonies will acknowledge Parliament sovereignty and we can put this taxation thing out of the way. So I mean, they, it's not like they're completely separate. Uh, the same powers the Parliament's claiming in one area can be used in the other. But, but I think Annette's right. I think we, we, we aren't that simple and they weren't either. You know, most of us care about multiple things. Sometimes we believe contradictory things. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if we, we can't really separate this into revolutionaries in the South who were revolutionary leaders in the South who were deeply invested in defending slavery and New Englanders who knew nothing about slavery and were not involved in slavery whatsoever mm -hmm. and, New, and New Englanders who care about taxation and Southerners who don't care about taxation. In fact, all of these things are happening across these yeah. places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. but if you try to imagine 100 years from now people describing the motivations of people today, yeah. about different things, <laughs> lots of different parts. A nervous laugh. Ner nervous laugh. All <laughs> <laughs> well, right, how self-conscious are any of us about our own motivations at any one moment in time? And the revolutionaries were really good at spinning out nightmare scenarios of what's gonna happen if they don't have power over their own lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, and these can take many different forms. And, and one is that Parliament might down the road do something to interfere with slavery, just as they are currently right. interfering with property through taxation. Yeah. Well, okay, so um, what about the role of race and racism in the way that the narrative of the American Revolution has unfolded well. over the last <laughs> Lies just rolling his eyes. <laughs> but no, but I think it's an, this is a really important question, right? I mean, the narrative of the American Revolution that's been the most popular and the most persistent has been one about unfolding progressive liberty. Sure, the revolution didn't pertain to women, didn't, in, uh, didn't pertain to black people, didn't pertain to Native Americans, it did, but, but eventually there's a kind of progressive promise of the revolution, the promise of liberty. Um, and we just talked about the contagion of liberty, the way that that language of liberty could be used by all kinds of marginalized people. But isn't there a role of race and racism in that very narrative that we've embedded in our histories? Yeah. Well, the notion that it all began in New England, uh, one of the things that's really clever, and I, I, I don't know if Nicole uh, wants to jump back in in the Q&A about the 1619, but of course, 
this predates the founding in New England by a year. And uh, there's been a longstanding tradition, uh, sort of a folkloric, but sometimes historians buy into it, that early America began in New England. Now we know New England, in fact, is involved in slavery. There's slaves in New England, but it's not as obvious. And, and that long tradition, uh, and focusing on the revolution's origins in New England and Boston, and even the Boston Massacre, uh, that is oftentimes fed a very sort of lily white uh, history of the revolution. And one of the things that's been so wonderful about the, this historical transformation that we're all been part of is that we've been reminded of just how central uh, Virginia and South Carolina and the rest of America was. And because of, you mentioned before that, or uh, Alan was mentioning that people think about slavery mainly, antebellum slavery, and certainly the the really powerful conflicts and things that are going on in Reconstruction era, it's all about race. It's clear yeah. that it's about race. Um, the historiography before, I mean, race is sort of, was buried yeah. in a way. And if you, just as colonial slavery wasn't as well known, wasn't as well discussed as antebellum slavery, racial attitudes, all of those kinds of things mm -hmm. were sort of in the background when we were writing about the revolution, when people were writing about the revolution before and the colonial period in general. Mm -hmm. Blacks were not, blacks, did, were there black people in the colonial period? Well, yeah, there were, <laughs> but you don't, that, the depiction is, it's very different. It's all the yeah, you know, yeah, pilgrims, absolutely. maybe Native Americans to some degree, probably much more so yeah. than, than black. The erasure. Yeah. I'd like to give a salute to uh, Hannah Jones in particular, because I think one of the significant aspects of the 1619 Project is the attempt to connect the past with the present. The attempt to suggest that many of the pressing problems that we have today have roots, they have historical roots, they have causes. And I think oftentimes historians, bless their hearts, mm -hmm. they, they are like, uh, you know, you go to a doctor and the doctor takes your medical history and you ask the doctor, well, doc, why are you taking my medical history? Uh, you want to make me better? And mm -hmm. the doctor says, no, I'm an antiquarian doctor. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just a history. I just, just want to know. <laughs> I think of your medical history as a thing in itself, not, not that it has any kinds of <laughs> subsequent uh, impact. And I think that I, hopefully historians will take up that challenge because despite your presence here, uh, when I read the newsletter of the American Historical Association almost every other month, as Arnold Schwarzenegger says about the California Republican Party, he says that uh, the history departments are dying at the box office. Mm. Uh, that is to say they're hemorrhaging majors, uh, people are not signing up for their courses. And I think it's because uh, this wonderful story <laughs> that we have to tell that has significant contemporary impact that latter aspect is amputated. And so no wonder people are fleeing in opposing directions. Let me ask one, or one offer one, one last provocation before we take well, some questions. Can I just questions. pick up on, on the, the you question can, about You can, but contagion. I'm gonna make, the, this is okay. the cue for them to start readying the questions okay. from but the audience. Say, so I'm saying that this is the one last. There question. is a contagion of liberty, but you find it in the abolitionist yeah. tradition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but there is uh, also a contagion of reaction which comes after the revolution. Mm -hmm. So most of the states that allowed freed blacks to vote take the vote away during the 1820s and 1830s. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's true in New Jersey about women voting mm -hmm. too, exactly. right? So exactly. it's not a straight line of progress yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. after the revolution. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so we've got some wonderful questions from all of you. There was an um, email address that you could send. So, um, so one question is, um, can you talk more? I think this is, is going to something that, um, that Annette raised when you talked about Thomas Jefferson's grandchildren. Can you talk more about the context between the Revolution and the Civil War that led grandchildren of the revolutionaries to be so forceful in their support of slavery when their grandparents may have struggled with it? <laughs> well, I think it's something that I suggested before. Slavery becomes, well, king cotton. Mm. It becomes enormously profitable. Slave, the prices of enslaved people are going up, up, and up. And when, some, when your property is going up, <laughs> you want to keep it. And you feel that, you know, that, you're, that they had a right to it, and therefore it's in their interest to do it. So I think between a generation of people who... 
thought that this is a system that's dying out, a system of people who or had enslaved people around them who they, they did not see them. It was not this notion of people in our family. It was clear. Jefferson thought slavery was a state of war mm -hmm. and that blacks and whites, that you know, the um, enslavers and enslaved people were in a war with one another. And there was no sentimental notion that these are members of our family. But by the 19th century, they began to tell a story against the abolitionists, mm -hmm. the white Southerners, that this, these are our family, this is a natural situation, a natural organic relationship, and plus, we're getting really, really rich. So it was in their interest <laughs> to say yeah. that, uh, that slavery was, was a positive good, and they tried to look to everything they could to, um, to justify it. Abolitionists m mounted in the North mounted a sort of religious-based objection to it, and they s basically said, well, we have our religion too. Mm. And we can look in the Bible and we see references to slaves and mm. so forth, and so we're right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the abolitionists thought they could shame the slaveholders into giving up slavery. And instead what they do is they double down on slavery mm -hmm. and say that it's a purely moral system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. The limits of shame. <laughs> That's the limits right. of shame. The limits of shame. Yeah. Okay. This, I love this question. Whoever wrote this question, thank you so much. Um, as historians, how do you tell the story of enslaved people when their stories only exist in archives through the eyes of their oppressors? Yeah. Uh, have you question. found any archives that have firsthand accounts of enslaved people, especially from this time period? And we're going to talk about the revolutionary period. You can yeah. interpret that as you will. Yeah. <laughs> it's scattered, but they're there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, actually, Carlton's Book of Negroes, uh, they're taking notes. Uh, and oftentimes, there were account it, it, one of the really interesting things is uh, they're oftentimes taking African Americans' word. Uh, and so they're writing down their words. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we've got petitions uh, submitted, uh, sometimes written by the actual people, other times dictated too. So it's. Uh, you know, the problem is they're scattered and, yeah. and they show up at key moments and then you want to know more. Mm -hmm. Where did they go? How long did they live? How many children they have? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we don't know. It's very tough mm -hmm. because you do have to keep in mind who is writing these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fortunate in the sense that some of the people that I write about were literate and they corresponded with Jefferson and they corresponded with one another. So I have their words too. So that's, that's, a, that's not a, a normal kind of situation, but it makes it a lot better because then you can sort of check what they're saying against what he's saying and other records as well. Yeah. And there are recollections of people, because it was Monticello, people wanted to go and talk to people who lived there. And so there are a number of recollections from people at Monticello who talk about um, the place, and not always in well, you know, not in glowing terms, anything like that. But you know, very pretty realistic stuff. Yeah. I think if you want a model for how you can read between and beyond the lines to reconstitute the lives of African Americans in slavery, Annette's book is the model. Thank you, Alan. It's, it's a remarkable book. And it won some prizes. It won some prizes, <laughs> and. What is it, 500 pages long? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and, it's, fi and it's, it's a fascinating read because every page is about how you explore, how you navigate through the sources yeah. in order to get at real human beings who have otherwise been rendered opaque. Yeah. And when I thought of the comment of slavery as war, what I thought of, of course, is the narrative by Equiano, where he basically says the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, with regard to the period we're talking about, there are not as many narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but there, uh, people, but there are some. people, but there are some. Uh, also, if I can skip ahead, <laughs> with regard. Okay, but you have to give a date to it. If you're going to skip course, ahead, you've got to give us a date. Okay. Obviously. Um, with regard, I think the slave revolt in Barbados in 1816, the British take all these depositions uh, okay. from Africans, and so you get their words on paper, mm -hmm. which leads me to the f next to the final point, which is that I suspect that historians have not explored court records as mm -hmm. much as they. Oh, could they, have. They, I was going to say that. There, that's a, that's another great source for them. Ariella Gross has done a lot yes. of that, and um, to get to get those voices. And then, of course, Freedom's Journal begins in mm -hmm. 1820s in New York, and that's another story. And mm -hmm. 
opens up a whole cornucopia of sources. Mm. So you've named a number of different kinds of sources that we can use to get at the experience of people who are marginalized, oppressed in this system, things like court records or in the margins or in the mentions of founders' documents or actually in some of these very rare, for this particular narrowly defined revolutionary period, um, uh, narratives. Um, isn't it true that all archives are shaped in ways that historians have to be aware of. That is that oh, this- Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, letters, people can put anything in letters. The fact that, they're that you say this doesn't mean that it's true. So you're always interrogating, you know, there are 20,000 Jefferson letters or something like that. You can go through, you have to interpret those and sort of interrogate them. And is this real? How can I corroborate what is being said there? You, yeah. you can't take anything at face value. It's just more, it's more fun in some ways trying to piece together things to see what you can find. But all evidence has to be interrogated. So different kinds of archival challenges. There, there the are skews. I mean, there are 20,000 Jefferson letters and zero Sally Hemings letters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but that said, uh, for example, I, I, I did a book about enslaved people who escaped during the War of 1812. And to my surprise, I found 11 letters written by former enslaved people uh, after the war, uh, often very revealing of, about their experiences. Uh, when I came across the first one of those letters, I did not know what to make of it because I didn't think I would ever find such a document. Mm -hmm. So I think there are more documents like that out there, and we have to keep our eyes open for them mm -hmm. and not assume that they're not, that they're not, that there. They're not there at right. all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are some very famous things, like Phyllis Wheatley's poetry, mm -hmm. for right. example, mm -hmm. is an extraordinary case. Um, but right, so there actually is new information that we find, mm -hmm. and we do have new methods for investigating things. Mm -hmm. um, There's just so much stuff at, at Monticello, things that had been there the whole time that no one just looked at because he was the only person mm -hmm. who was important. But they have just lots of, mate through material culture, mm -hmm. uh, through all other kinds of records, archaeology, all kinds of things that you can look at to, to bring up, to bring the story forward, not just saying you have to rely on letters or you don't have anything. Letters that have to be, as I said, interrogate, interrogated themselves. I think sometimes people think that history is this kind of known thing or knowable thing, and it is this one thing, and that once you know it, it's known, mm -hmm. rather than that we continue to discover and to learn mm -hmm. more, and that it develops over time. And I think that's an enormously important, mm -hmm. important point and part of what we're trying to illustrate here. So here's a, another great question. Um, much of the 1619 Project has been contested on the grounds that it is objective versus biased. Um, the question is, is objectivity even possible when writing history through historical interpretation? That is, is objectivity even possible? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you can be objective about the facts. I mean, mm. you know, just what they, uh, Alan and Annette have been talking about, uh, you know, piecing together. Uh, uh, what happened and what someone said, but uh, uh, oftentimes what you do with that uh, is uh, that that's where um, different people are going to sometimes come to different conclusions. Well, if I can reframe the question, <laughs> I, I think what's at issue with regard to why we're sitting here is the question of facts versus interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I think that certain critics took issue with interpretations. Mm -hmm. And it, what's interesting, if you look at the current issue of the American Historical Review, you have reviewers taking issue with some of the 1619 critics, not, not with regard to 1619, but with regard to their own scholarship, mm. suggesting that they may have uh, overestimated the anti-slavery impulse in mm. pre-1860 North America. Uh, perhaps they may have overestimated the extent to which uh, Lincoln's army during the Civil War uh, was motivated by ideology as opposed to getting a paycheck. Mm. So th these are interpretations. I mean, in, in graduate school, we're, we're always taught that history is argument without end, mm -hmm. that your only obligation to history is to rewrite it. <laughs> but it seems that with regard to the 1619 Project, uh, to coin a phrase, uh, some folks are saying, we've come to the end of historiography, to use <laughs> your phrase that there are only certain inter interpretations that should last for all time. Mm -hmm. And you cannot quote 
you, you cannot challenge Lincoln, I mean, for example, even though one of the most significant public, black public intellectuals of the 20th century, uh, Lerone Bennett, wrote an entire book uh, expanding upon what uh, Hannah Jones said. And by the way, go to C-SPAN if you want to see uh, what might not be the finest hour of some of our Lincoln scholars as they try to rake Lerone Bennett over the coals for that book. It's, it's, it's quite a spectacle. Well, you know, objectivity, you can't have pure objectivity, but you can't have perfection in anything. But that doesn't mean that you don't try for it. You should strive for it. Yeah. Um, whether you achieve it or not is another thing. And some people do it, some people are better at it than others, are more detached. It depends on, you know, why you're doing it, you know, what brings you to a topic. Um, so I, I think you can't, you can't be perfect objectivity, but you should strive for it. So this is actually a question from me because we only have about five minutes left, which is that um, I started this evening by saying that I thought it was really important um, for us to talk about process, talk about how historians evaluate evidence to make historical arguments, and that sharing that process and sharing the fact of that process is really powerful for the public. You think that's true? You can just say yes and then- Of course we can say yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're engaged in acts of translation. We're trying, to, we're trying to interpret for people in our own time what we have learned about people living in the past. And as Gerald says, we need to pay attention to things that people in our present want to understand about the past. That, that needs to be part of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So when people pick up a, a work of history, how should they assess that work of history? How should they understand what it is that that work of history is telling them? When you take a book off the shelf at a bookstore, I was going to name one, but I think we're not supposed to brand in here. Anyway, <laughs> you take a book off the bookshelf. Let's assume that it's one of those very large bookstores, and so they only have certain histories <laughs> on the shelves. How is it that you can understand what it is you're reading? How do you understand that work of history. How can you understand what kind of evidence and argument the person is bringing to bear? Read more than one. Yeah. 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 I mean, seriously. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to read different people on the same topic mm -hmm. and see, you know, what, look at their, you know, the, their notes, look at how they're arguing, what they're saying, and mm -hmm. um, judge from there. Reading one is not enough, I would mm -hmm. say. That, that certainly follows the theme that history is not just this one knowable thing that we somehow are yeah. able to reveal all, and there it is, it's done and dusted or tied up with a bow or some other wonderful metaphor. Um, so one thought I had is that um, after I know this is, this is um, being streamed right now, but it's going to be available later, we'll be able to have a transcript, I think, at some point, and I thought it would be really useful for us to generate a list of some of the um, books and some of the documentaries and some of the other references that we've made during this conversation mm. to make that available to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. OK, so any last comments from any of you? Any last things you want to say about slavery and the American Revolution? Liberty, freedom. Yeah. <laughs> well, as we were talking uh, during dinner, one yeah. of the books your institute published uh, by William Pettigrew, Freedom's mm -hmm. Debt, I don't think got enough uh, publicity, <laughs> enough attention. It's an analysis of the so-called Glorious Revolution, 1688, which precedes 1776. And I think it's important to try to connect 1688 and 1776. And it's in many ways a follow-on in my interpretation to Edmund Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom, where he tried to connect those two phenomena. Because freedom's debt, according to Pettigrew, is the fact that the merchant class wanted to elbow the monarch out of exclusive control British. of the African slave trade, and mm -hmm. deregulation of the African slave trade, the free market in Africans is what I called it. And then there's the notion of liberty and rights that is put forward, and that's freedom's debt. Uh, that is to say the liberties that we now think we can take for granted uh, come out of this very complex situation involving uh, slavery. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you look at many of the key events over many decades, in my estimation, not only 1688, 1776, 1836, the secession of uh, Texas from Mexico, 1861, the failed secession, mm -hmm. uh, you find slavery at the heart of the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I would say is, uh, you know, I think 
I think I feel a, a great debt to the 1619 project because we live in a moment uh, where interest in history, in some guys at least, is, is dropping off. Uh, the visitorship at a lot of our historic sites is down. Um, uh, as Gerald said, uh, uh, numbers of history majors is dropping. So I think the more the more discussion there is like this, the better. Because I think you're reminding people how much stake we have, we all have in this sort of thing. So I, I think it's I think it's all for the good. Yeah. I, th I think if you go to bookstores, you see mostly pretty conventional books uh, about top leaders in American history. And they mostly tell a reassuring story mm -hmm. about their heroism feeding into a better and better America. And what the 1619 Project has done is, is offer us an unsettling narrative, mm -hmm. uh, the one that forces us to think even if we don't agree with parts of it, you're forced to think about the fundamentals of American history. And I think that's been immensely useful. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lovely place to stop. Thank you all so much.